And welcome once again to The Breakfast. And now let's go back in history to the year 1912 uh, to talk about a boxer. And of course, at uh, that time was one of the first black world heavyweight champions who on this day uh, was arrested for violating what was called the Man Act. His name, Jack Johnson, and was um, named the Gavelstone Giant. He was an American boxer who, in this time, in 1912 and in that era, the Jim Crow era, as it was popularly called, was the first world heavyweight champion. Um, he, at that time, opened a restaurant, uh, which was a desegregated restaurant that was run by his wife, a white woman. On this day, he was arrested, or one of the times he was arrested on the grounds that his relationship with Lucille Cameron, who was his wife, a white woman, violated what was called the Mann Act, which was an act against transporting women against straight, uh, state lines for immoral purposes. Um, apparently, his wife, Lucille Cameron, was a sex worker. And so he was arrested on this day in 1912. Um, eventually, of course, that case was dropped. Uh, Jack Johnson eventually was arrested multiple other times for, you know, the same case. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things that was controversial about this was, was the fact that he was tried and found guilty at all times by an all-white jury and sentenced to, uh, you know, sometimes a year and a day, sometimes a little bit uh, more than a year in prison um, for, you know, the same act. And he eventually, of course, continued fighting for money and, of course, opened other businesses and, uh, you know, continued you know, to run his business while, of course, still boxing. Um, he later was pardoned by former U.S. President Donald Trump. But on this day, he became a person who was arrested for violating that man act simply because his wife, uh, who was a white woman, was an alleged sex worker. And um, it was against uh, what was called the man act at that time in 1912 to 1913. That's what we have for you in history today. Now, let's get into our first major conversation on the program this morning. We're talking security and the story that has broken headlines across Nigeria in the last 24 hours. The allegations by the Wall Street Journal that the Nigerian government paid uh, bandits uh, in Katsina State $50,000 in order to buy back an anti-aircraft weapon that was taken from Nigeria's um, um, fighting soldiers. Uh, it's said that the, the weapon needed to be bought back so that the president's plane would be safe if he decided to fly over Katsina. This morning, we're speaking with the National Publicity Secretary of the Youth Party, Mr. Ayodili Adio. Uh, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. Thank you for having me. We also have with us uh, Yahuza Getso was an anti-terrorism and intelligence expert. Morning, Mr. Getzo. Great to see you this morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Good morning. Uh, I want us to start with the uh, well, anti-terrorism and intelligence expert. I, I want you to share your thoughts on the story, first of all. Um, the Nigerian Air Force, of course, has put out a statement saying that it is a complete hoax and, um, you know, fabrication. And, of course, it's you know, as always, set us, um, you know, set up to embarrass the president and to derail the fight against insurgencies. Uh, but when you read the story, did it, you know, seem very likely that something like that could happen? Well, uh, this didn't come to me as a surprise uh, because uh, a Nigerian government under Buhari's watch, as well as the, the, the politicians of uh, PDP, APC, APGA, whatever you have, um, that is their trend. Uh, it has been their attitude. And um, going by what has been happening in the last six years, five to six years or seven years, uh, one can easily accept that. Uh, because uh, Nigerian security and Nigerian intelligence have been compromised uh, in many situations and in many circumstances. In the case of the issues related to uh, kidnapping, arm, uh, band bandatry, uh, armed robbery, the, 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 and all other sagas that has been happening, especially around the the Katsina, uh, the Katsina state and other northwestern states as well as uh, other part of the country. There are reasons we could believe that, and there are reasons we could say that it may be just a political. Uh, the reasons why we can accept that is the fact that um, I have been saying, and I am repeating myself, that all the governors of all the states where this uh, bandatory and kidnapping for ransom, as well as other forest criminality is happening, 
And um, uh, there is a very close relationship between the bandits commanders, commanders and the, the governments of the states. And there is also a very close relationship uh, between the security operatives and um, the, 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 the bandits uh, commanders. Uh, the simple reason here is the fact that uh, they have not, they have been arresting and apprehending many of the criminals, uh, presenting or showcasing or um, a kind of presenting, making a presentation, a public presentation uh, that they have uh, received some of the repentance bandits. So, but we have not had any action, actionable measure, or any framework analysis or a framework uh, system that is scheming the monitoring, a kind of guiding the process of uh, managing those so-called repentant bandits. That is one. Uh, secondly, I always refer back to Lai Mohammed as well as the National RFI and the governors of uh, Zamfara, Sokoto, and the, some of the leadership of the governors, uh, leadership part of the uh, Akazana state government as well as the Niger state government that they have been saying that they are in touch. They have been in touch with this, the criminal leaders. And uh, after the apprehension of Mr. ABC, they will say that we are working hard to see that they have been rescued. That's what happens to the children of Bangara. That's what happens to the children of Jengebe. That's what happens to the children of Kagara. That's what happens to the children of Binung, uh, uh, Bini Yauri. That's what happens to many who were apprehended, who were kidnapped in many parts of Kazana, many parts of Niger, many parts of Kaduna, uh, many uh, parts of uh, Zamfara Sokoto and others are alive. And there is also very clear testimony uh, and uh, allegation from Isa local government uh, around Sabambini, between Isa Sabambini and uh, Zurmi, which is one of the notorious uh, hideout of the criminals, that uh, uh, the, 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 the commissioner for security affairs of Sokoto State was, uh, was a kind of um, allegation was raised against him by his indigenous community, that is Isa, where he came from, uh, which led to destruction and burning of his house, and yet, uh, we didn't get any feedback uh, from the government. And uh, we see, we saw the district head uh, standing before the community at the Friday mosque, swearing in with the Quran that uh, he doesn't have any hands and if he has whatever this and that. So uh, it is very, very difficult. And uh, we had many iota of evidences, uh, many reasons and many evidences that these governments in these states, they have either direct, if not directly, indirect relationship with these criminals. If they don't have, how, how are they accessing? How are they working to contact these criminals when they kidnap someone? Uh, recently, just uh, about in 24 hours or more than that, the Emir of Bungudu uh, regained his, uh, his, uh, uh, freedom. Uh, his, yeah. his, his freedom. So how does that happen? I, I wonder who are really the, the contacts between the criminals in the forest and the government. Uh, because we have not seen any bloodshed, we have not seen anybody being killed, and uh, we are still visiting some part of this forest in conducting research, and we realize that some of the uh, these air uh, locations are still uh, uh, hard to reach, are difficult. Uh, yes, of course, they become hard to reach and difficult terrain, not because of what it is. I know some part of the hard to reach, the original hard to reach and the original uh, difficult terrain uh, are very, very difficult. I find it very, very difficult when visiting them. But I know there are common locations that uh, government have invested so much in putting a tight road or in, in, in providing some social uh, amenities like hospitals, schools, and other things, and other need social structures, but they are not being accessible by those who uh, it was meant for them. So, which means, uh, actually, uh, there are uh, questions. And I have uh, made a, a, an assertion in many national and international media that uh, these guys really in Kaduna, in Kasana, in part of uh, Niger, and in part of Zamfara, they own the A, that is uh, anti-aircraft. This has been long. It's not, this is not the first time, uh, in, this is the first time the Air Force are responding to it. But I have been saying that, I have been confirming and reaffirming that these guys have 
uh, have own anti -air aircraft uh, 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 missiles, and government did nothing. So I, 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 I really find it very, very difficult how they get access to these arms. And uh, if at all government have been saying that we know them, we know their finances, we know where they are. So what are you doing that you are chasing shadow? Putting off the network is not a solution. You are chasing shadow. Uh, closing markets is chasing shadow. You know their locations. You know who they are. You have their, their contact. If they kidnap someone, you know how to contact them and get the person a release. So why can't you deal with them and finish the matter rather than wasting everybody's time and deceiving everybody in the country? Okay, so um, I'd also like to ask, let's stay with the issue of the ransom. Although we have, you know, government and uh, uh, over the time saying, oh, we're not paying ransom. Ransom is not being paid. But in this particular case, if the story is anything to go by, do you think that, you know, the option of paying ransom is the best? I mean, we're talking about the Nigerian Air Force here. Paying a ransom, is that the best that we can do? Well, I don't support pay ransom in any circumstance, either in the case of AA uh, and air, aircraft and missile or in any situation, I don't support. And I will never support uh, pay ransom in any circumstance. Even though uh, there may be some certain tactical strategy that can be used as a schemic strategy towards attending or understanding some of the complexities of the forest. Uh, which is uh, one of the challenges of the Nigerian security operatives. However, I believe sincerely that the money shouldn't be a way, the best way of uh, addressing the issue. Because if you know, for example, one of the suspects, that is uh, uh, Dankalemi or Halilu or Turji, uh, that is uh, uh, some of these are the key uh, bandits that are uh, uh, key of bandit commanders that uh, there is a high suspicion and the confidence that they own, they, are, they, own they, are, they, they have in their possession the, the AA. So if at all you know, their locations are known and their locations, none of them their location that, that is up to 40 kilometer radius. So if you know, the, we know their locations, uh, government knows their locations, security operative knows their location, and you are in, in touch with them. Why do you have to go on paying the alleged $50,000 ransom? I'm not sure. I'm not sure that the money has been paid. But I will not be surprised if the money is paid. And I'm not in support in any way of paying ransom to, to the bandits. All right. Either uh, by kidnapping or either by uh, releasing arms. I'm not in support of that. All right. Uh, let's bring in um, the National Publicity Secretary of the Youth Party, um, Ayodele Adio. Uh, good morning once again. Um, and let's also get your thoughts on this one. The, of course, the Nigerian government has put out a statement saying that this is a hoax and, um, um, you know, it's a, a fake story by the Wall Street Journal. Um, so l let me sh get your thoughts. Uh, do you agree with the Nigerian government that, you know, how can they pay... Uh, for a weapon, or to buy a weapon back from people that they have been fighting and defeating? Well, I think it's a very, it's a very straight one. Um, but, but like, you know, like, um, you know, Alex Getsu just said, if we're going to go by antecedents and see which of the parties, you know, have, has denied or has lied about setting security situations in the last six years, it would be the Nigerian government. And if I were to bet against any of the two parties, I would, I would happily be betting against the Nigerian government, even though it's sad um, to realize that um, we would be paying $50,000 to retrieve back um, an anti-aircraft um, weapon from bandits and terrorists living in the forest. Now, whether or not this transaction has happened, what we cannot deny is that our forest, particularly in Zamfara, Katsina, um, Biriningwari, somewhere in Kaduna State, are controlled exclusively by these bandits, right? The entire Rugu forest stretch is controlled exclusively by these individuals. In fact, they control tens and tens of communities um, across the northwestern part of the country and in many places in the north-central part of the country. So many communities are now under the control of the bandits in Niger State, which wasn't the case 
this case some six, seven years ago. So what you cannot deny is the fact that, um, you know, bandits or terrorists in the northwestern part of the country are increasingly growing their capabilities um, to lay siege on the Nigerian state. And uh, what you also cannot deny is the lack of capacity or the dwindling capacity of the Nigerian state to effectively respond um, to these acts of terrorism by these bandits or so-called terrorist groups um, the northwestern part of the country. Uh, and just like, um, 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 you know, Ahmed Getwe just said, it's, it's clear that they know where these bandits are. But the problem is the lack of capacity to, to effectively flush these bandits uh, um, out of their, their, their area. You know, and again, just two weeks ago, um, a senior naval officer um, spoke before the National Assembly and talked about the proliferation of arms coming in from Niger and Chad, largely from Chadian soldiers who are selling these arms for $20 or $30. And most of these arms are flowing in all the way from Libya down to Chad. And these soldiers are selling these arms and they easily find their ways across the border. And her statement was quite clear and emphatic that as long as that flow continues to happen from Libya to Chad and from the Chadian borders and the Nigerian borders into Nigeria, we will never be able to deal with insecurity in our country. So the Nigerian government is failing clearly or spectacularly in two ways. One, our inability to deal with the inflow and the proliferation of light arms, and of course, in this case, sophisticated weapons um, from our borders in Chad and Niger into Nigeria. And of course, our internal capacity to respond to crime um, is a serious problem that the Nigerian state is grappling with. Um, we can try, they can spin it whichever way that they want to. But one thing that is difficult to spin is the lack of state capacity to deal and respond effectively to these crimes. Now, many people forget that in many of these communities that these atrocities happen, people have lived in these communities for hundreds of years. Even places like Rugu, you have people who have lived in Rugu for hundreds of years. Now, what suddenly changed overnight um, is the consequence of bad governance over the years. And I hear every time the excuses that the government makes um, that the terrain is difficult, to access some of these villages is difficult. Excuse me. Whose job is it to provide infrastructure in many of these communities to allow access into those communities a lot easier? It's the government that is supposed to do that. And then they turn around again to tell you that access to these places are difficult. Abandoning the people in those communities in the hands of bandits and terrorists uh, uh, you know, who, are, who kill them every day, who, who stop them from going to farms, who rape their women, who plunge them into penury. So again, the state has to increase its capacity to respond um, to these acts of terrorism. Otherwise, um, it's a waste of time debating whether or not the Wall Street Journal um, has told the story that is false or that is true. It, it's just a typical way of spinning uh, uh, a narrative that is clear before our very eyes that terrorists are gaining traction in the Northwest, that they are taking places in the North Central part of the country, and their capacity to inflict pain on the Nigerian people is increasing by the day. Well, That's the well, issue. Mr. Mr. Adio, um, uh, um, sorry, Mr. Mr. Adio, um, two things that I, I, I hope you can quickly, um, you know, respond to these things. Uh, the first one would be um, on how you know you feel you know your your publicity secretary for the youth party um with regards to government's efforts um after the promises that were made before getting into power um some of the narratives that were sold in 2014 and seeing how far we've come six years later um, it still doesn't feel like anything much has changed um, but at the same time, this same government continues to say that there are bandits repenting in their thousands, you know, every now and then. There's reports that 13,000 of these bandits and terrorists have repented, um, uh, you know, to the Nigerian government. So does this, do, do you believe these things? And are you disappointed as, you know, as a, as a Nigerian that we still are having these conversations um, today? Um. <laughs> I'll tell you most sincerely that I am, I, am, I am disappointed as a person. And of course, as a political party, we are um, extremely disappointed because um, for anything, we believed that the experience of Mr. President being in the military and um, rising to the rank of the general 
um, would have played a critical role um, in managing insecurity in our country. Unfortunately, that has not been the case. And I explained to you why that hasn't uh, been the case. And I'll explain to you why that hasn't been the case. And it's because we have not set our priorities straight. Now, what we have done in the Youth Party, for instance, is to publish a document called the Police Reforms, uh, which was supposed to boost internal security in our country. And what did that paper essentially do? Because um, we, have, we, have, we have viewed this problem um, broadly and fingered the problem right at the failure of internal security. There's a complete breakdown of internal security in our country. And the police is supposed to be responsible for providing this internal security in our country. Now, what we have done not just in the last six years, in fact, in the last 10 years, is to bring in the military who are supposed to be uh, fighting against external aggression to maintain internal security in our country. And that cannot work. And in many communities, if you, if, if, I'm sure you've had numerous reports of killings in many communities in Katina, in Zamfara, in, in Kaduna, in Niger. Many of these killings happen in communities, in rural communities across the northwestern part of the country where there is no police presence or inadequate police presence to protect the people in those communities. There are so many people who would rather, and as I speak to you, who would rather pay a fine to these bandits to access their farms than to put their hopes in the state to protect them via the police. So what are we saying? We're saying that we need to increase the capacity of the police to respond to internal security threats. And to do that, we need to invest in the training of the Nigerian police force um, to boost their skills and their competencies to be able to respond to crime in the 21st century. That will entail um, improving their forensic lab, that will entail, of course, improving their remuneration. Uh, that would entail an entire restructuring of the Nigerian police, as we, as we rightly pointed in the document, so that state governors can have the powers to empower community policing in many of these communities that lack the presence um, of the Nigerian police. We need strong community polices who are well-equipped, who are well-funded, who are well-renumerated, who are well-trained, to be able to respond to local crimes in these communities. If we don't do that, if we keep on expecting the Nigerian military to be deployed from wherever they are deployed, to go and deal with a problem in Rugu, to go and deal with a problem uh, 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 in Zamfara, to go and deal with a problem in Niger, we'll simply be blinking in the dark. And, and Ahmed gets to made a very, very important point, that the geography of many of these places in northwestern Nigeria, the geography where many of these bandits are operating is difficult for the Nigerian army. Many of them do not understand the geography in the places where they are going to fight. But if you have trained a local police force who are, who are groomed in that particular community, who understand the geography in the places they are supposed to respond to those crimes, you will see better crime prevention uh, right. uh, and better responses to some of these criminalities that we see in this community. At the moment, it doesn't look to me like there's a clear strategy to deal with insecurity, which is why we also have proposed that there needs to be a national security commission that draws intelligence um, from every state of the Federation, and not just from security agents, uh, our former security personnel, but from geographers, okay, from, okay. from social scientists, right, on, and from economists, because the problem is not just boots on ground, it's about a socioeconomic condition that is allowing crime also to thrive. Okay, but let's also look at this other uh, concern. I mean, uh, the fact that over, over the years, over time, uh, there's been a lot of concern and worry that uh, even this bandit or terrorist are becoming more equipped. They have better, uh, you know, weaponry than, you know, the Nigerian uh, uh, force entirely. Now, the, the question is, how are they getting these weapons? I mean, how do we get such sensitive weapons, such weapons in their hands? Now, in this particular case, although, you know, you have the Nigerian Air Force refuting that, saying that's not true, the claim is that, uh, you know, they lost the anti-graft uh, gun in the battle with the Nigerian army. So, uh, first of all, they'd like to know how these weapons are getting into their hands and what government can do to ensure that, you know, all of these sensitive weapons don't end up in the hands of this uh, uh, bandit uh, and Mr. terrorist. Mr. Getso, you can go ahead with that one. Um, well, 
There are one. Let me before I go into that, uh, let me make a little rider to my my to Ayodele. Uh, the issue is is the question is I have is do we even have the police? Do we even have the military? As far as I'm concerned, what do we have is errands. That's the question. They don't have passion. They don't have patriotism. They don't have compassion. They don't have interest of their job. What we have in the last 35, 22 to 35 years is recruitment of errands, not recruitment of Nigerian army or Nigerian police or Nigerian custom or Nigerian immigration or Nigerian civil defense or the, the drugs law enforcement agents. We are having a recruitment of errands where a councillor is submitting the list, where a chairman, local, local government chairman is submitting his list, emirates, uh, is the tra tra traditional and religious institutions are submitting names and those names are those are the people that are being enlisted into the security. Now, going back to, to, to her question, uh, the reality is these criminals are indigenous of all these communities. 99.9% .9 of those who are committing crimes in northwestern Nigeria, as far as I'm concerned, as a professional uh, uh, criminality, uh, forest criminality therapist, and as an expert on criminals' behavior, and based on facts and evidence, these arms are coming through our border. They are not coming through any uh, 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 any other person. And there have been connivance. There are a number of apprehensions made by the government, whereby a government presented to us, to the public, not to me, or not to professionals like me, to the public, that there is a connivance where a policeman or a military was found guilty of conniving with these criminals in selling arms. The issue is, have, have you ever had in the last six years or so anybody that had been uh, uh, punished in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the public to serve as a deterrent? Was there any feedback from the police, from the military, from the DSS after apprehension of anybody, any criminals found wanting in possession of RPG, PMG, AK-47, AK-49, and also... They are, uh, yes, of course, as I have been saying, the arm importers, the arm traders are foreigners, which are less than 1%, while the criminals are 99% indigenous. But the arm movers and arm transporters are Nigerians. So these arms, yes, of course, they may be coming through uh, uh, some illegal, there are maybe some uh, uh, proportion or percentage that is coming through an illegal means. But as far as I'm concerned, if we really have a government, if we really have a serious government, if we really have a serious state, if we really have a sovereign state, if we really have a military and intelligence system, a police and intelligence system of police, a DSS and intelligence system of DSS in operations, and they are getting all required support and at the same time, they are being supervised by, uh, from the presidency or by the presidency. This could have been curtailed and this could have been managed. But because of the three or four reasons, one, there is no supervision from the presidency and from the agents that are reporting and providing feedback to the president. That is one of the reasons. Secondly, the president is so adamant that he doesn't care. What he cares is to provide approval for money to be spent on security. But whether people are being secured or result is being uh, uh, getting or not, nothing is happening. Our proliferation is on the rise. I want to tell you, and I have been warning the state, not only the state of Zamfara, but the Nigerian state, that during the closure, the shutdown of network in Zamfara, and Kazana, the amount of arm being imported into Nigeria outnumbered by uh, by over fifty percent than what it was uh, than what was imported before. And they know they are getting information, they are getting intelligence on how these arms are being proliferated. There are common ways, there are difficult ways, there are simple ways, 
there are there are four as far as this supply chain mechanism can have not been destroyed that is arm importers they have their own syndicate arm traders they have their own syndicate arm transporters they have them or their own syndicate armed movers they have their own syndicate and this has been the reason why arms are being proliferated and these arms are not coming through any forest border, forest border. Yes, of course, some little are coming through the forest border, but most of these arms are coming through the actual border where you and me can use to cross to Niger, to Benin, to, to Togo, to Cameroon, to Chad, and so on and so forth. Wow. Uh, but the reason why it cannot be managed is one of the key reasons, as mentioned by Ayodele, that... Uh, uh, we don't have the capacity. It's not that we don't have the capacity, but we don't have the willingness. There is no political will. There is no administrative will. There is no, there is no, no, you, what you have, as far as I'm concerned, is not police institution. Reza is an errant institution. Why? Because how were they recruited into the services? How were they recruited? Which I just read recently. Uh, it makes me had a sleepless night and I cried throughout the night when I saw 34,000 police were mobilized to Anambra for election. If you can mobilize that, why can't you mobilize a, 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 a less people with 50% of that? You can manage the, the issue of uh, the, 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 the Rugu and the other forest uh, my, my colleague is, uh, is talking about. And you can also manage even the borderline. That lady who was speaking on behalf of Nigerian Navy, when I heard her talking, I laughed because I feel how how comes this became have, have what she is uh, having as her rank. Because as far as I'm concerned, if she really have that rank, I expected her to be more more intelligent and more elaborate, and uh, she wouldn't have made some of the statements she made in the public, because some of the informations regarding the movement of the arms and um, how arms are coming into the country and proliferations and so on and so forth are not supposed to be made public. We are politicizing and we are deceiving ourselves. And as far as I'm concerned, we are breeding criminality. We are not eliminating criminality. Right, Mr. We are not Mr. working Gatto, towards addressing the issues of criminality. And we are also opening more ways of uh, kind of uh, making, improving the capacity of the criminals, in the capacity of the armed bandits, uh, the capacity of the armed traders, the capacity of the uh, uh, armed arm movers, the capacity of the armed importers. And also we are also breeding the the future criminality that Nigeria may not be able to manage. All right, Mr. Yah um well, I'm going to come back to you with regards to the security and, of course, on-ground assessment on some of these things. Um, I want us to bring back Ayodele Adio. Um, if you've been listening, of course, uh, some of the things that has, have been described by Mr. Getsu are really scary um, and frightening, you know, seeing, you know, what is likely to occur in the near future. Uh, Mr. Adio, what would you say Nigeria needs? Because we have, you know, about a year plus to the next elections. Um, I'm not sure how this will play out or how Nigeria would survive security-wise um, before the next elections. But what would you say must be done if we're serious as a country uh, to help the country heal from this insecurity challenge? I think we need a complete overhaul of our internal security architecture. Well, Mr. Adio, Adio I, I, I understand that. Um, but... We are all Nigerians, and I want you to, you know, share this, you know, with me from, you know, a, a personal perspective. You, yes, that's what we need. This is the same way, you know, before the NSAS protests and during the protests. The call then was for police reforms. None of that has been done. So we know what we need, but it doesn't seem likely that any of this will happen. But, so, I mean, so... I mean, which is the problem? Um, we can't keep saying that we know what we need and none of it is likely to happen. And you're saying it's not likely to happen because of the kind of politicians yes, that you have exactly. in power. The, because the real problem um, is the lack of political will to implement some of these provisions that will make our country a lot more secure, that will stop the bloodshed, 
that will stop the impunity, that will stop the endless killings and murder and arson across our country is the lack of political will. And that is why, that is why we keep on saying that elections have consequences. And rather than sell your vote, um, you know, for a pot of soup um, or for a loaf of bread, you must begin to ask more critical questions about the kind of politicians that we elect at every single level, from local government to state government, and of course, up, up, uh, up down to the presidency, because elections do have consequences. And I like that you put your hand right on the bottom, where you say that there is a, a lack of political will to implement some of these ideas um, that are quite simple on the surface. Why is it that today our training colleges of police, of, of police are still in a very dilapidated state? Why is it that as of today uh, our police officers are still living in penury? We transfer them from one state to the other and we don't make any adequate provisions for them to survive. Why is it that at this very state in our country, the entry level, the screening level of police officers or soldiers is such that a politician can put a shirt on 20 people in his community and off he goes into the police academy. So these are very simplistic and basic things that someone with a political will can ensure that there is quality control across board to ensure that the people who are recruiting into the police force are people of competence, of character, and people that are willing to upskill. We also should ensure that once they get into the police, they are provided with the right skills, the right equipment, and the right environment to apply the skills that they have, uh, they have acquired over time. We also should ensure that we remunerate them accordingly so that they don't have to stay on street corners to use their guns to threaten average Nigerians and in fact rob average Nigerians of their hard-earned monies because they want an excuse to survive. Now, all of these things will not happen if we continue to elect the very same politicians that have put us in this mess altogether. Because the police problem did not start today. It's been over 20 years coming when we have vulgarized the entire institution and have plunged it into what, you know, my good friend calls an errant institution as we speak today. Because there has not been any adequate attention paid to the development of this sector over the years. And we keep electing these same kinds of politicians who make vague promises who come into power and are arrogant about the fact that people are dying on their watch every day and they don't seem to care. That's the most hurtful part of it. They don't seem to care that thousands of people are dying under their watch every single month and they seem not to be able to find the political will to put the necessary things in place to ensure change comes. And that's why we are crying that young people across the country, particularly in these communities, where they have buried their mothers, where they have buried their sisters, where they have buried their fathers, where they cannot go to farm to farm. So go and register to vote, to ensure that their vote counts, and to vote out these politicians who have brought nothing but bloodshed to them and their communities. And to vote political parties in, not because they, they, are, they are dominant or not, but because they have a clear plan, a clear plan to secure the country, to create wealth for the Nigerian citizens, and to move our country forward. Enough of this kind of politicking, where we think in election cycles, just like, like the speaker said, we're deploying thousands of, of, of policemen to go and protect ballot boxes in Anambra State, where people are dying in Katsina and in Zafara every single day. We're we are deploying thousands of soldiers to protect oil installations in the Niger Delta, when people are dying every single day. We have deployed police officers to protect VIPs in our country when there are so many communities without police presence in our country. When will this madness stop? The primary purpose of governance is the security and the welfare of the average Nigerian. And they have jettisoned this. And we continue to excuse their incompetence. We continue to excuse their lack of patriotism because they are from some dominant political party or what? Mm. Let's wake okay. up and smell the coffee. This country is our own and it is sinking. If we don't act quick, our country will be overrun by bandits and terrorists and will we'll be paying homage to warlords across our country. All right, let's bring in Mr. Getso at this point in time.
Uh, I'd like to find out, you know, because some persons have described, you know, the relationship between the Nigerian government and this bandit or terrorist as cordial. They seem to have a cordial relationship. But the question here is, could it be that the Nigerian government, uh, to say that, yes, the force, they don't have the capacity, they don't have enough uh, personnel, they don't have the equipment, you know, to go ahead. Because from all that is going on, it feels like we know where these bandits are. Uh, we have, we're in communication with this bandit or this terrorist, however you want to put it. But what is stopping the arrest? Well, uh, I'm an indigenous of northern, northwestern Nigeria. I've been from Kano State in Gwaza local government. Uh, having been to all political wards and all commun communities in the 19 northern states, uh, with uh, a particular attention to the areas of uh, where this thing is happening, uh, even though uh, I have been to almost uh, to all part of West African states, uh, all the forests, I know what it is like uh, if you switch off a light in my room and uh, when I'm looking for a needle, I know where to find it. That's how I, I have a knowledge and understanding of the uh, West African forest. Uh, so um, the issue of either... The, uh, there is a relationship, a cordial relationship between the bandits and the, uh, the, 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 the states or the, the Nigerian state or rather the states uh, of Zamfara, Kazana, Sokoto, Kaduna and where all these things are happening. The answer is yes. And I'm saying it in, in caps, in capital letter and in bold and italic. Let everybody know and quote me everywhere that I say that the states have a cordial relationship with, with bandits in the forest within their domain. I have to, I want to, I, I need to state some of the reasons that I can say it in public. There are some reasons that I can't say it in public, but the security operatives and the government of these states knew what I had been, information I had been sharing with them, and they know what I know. And they know what I know is happening in their respective states. I'm not there as a spy. I'm just there as an investigator. I go to the forest. I go to the security agencies. I go everywhere because I need to. I am conducting a field-based research. Now that I'm talking to you, I've been in the field in almost almost uh, 30 days. I have not been with my family. I have been moving around the states of the northeast and the northwest. So as far as I'm concerned. The reasons I want to state is how do government have contact to get the children of Jengebe, the school children that were kidnapped, the one that were kidnapped in, uh, in, in Maradu, the one that were kidnapped in Kagara, the one that were kidnapped in, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, 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 Ankara. And at the same time, recently, the Emir of Bungudu, uh, Sir Kim Fulani Bungudu has been released. Can government, from the statement we, 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 we read, that police and um, the, the family work as a team to, together with the two governments, government of the two states. That is for one person. That is for the Emir of Bungudu. Have they forgotten that there are thousands in captivity in the last two years or thereby? So, but how do government work out modalities right, to create a relationship? to bring out, to get the Emir of Bungudu free. How do they get the children of uh, Kagara? How do they get the children of uh, 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 um, uh, Kagara, Tegina, uh, Kankara, Jengebe, and other places? Mr. Mr. Gatso, so um, it means it is we'll, very we'll clear that there uh, is an undermined relationship. Uh, there is a very clear relationship. Uh, Governor Masari, and um, other governor, uh, governor Matoli and others, they have been proclaiming. All right. Even though it's not just proclaiming because we have evidence. Yeah, also that they have gone and conducted dialogue with these guys. The dialogue I have been disputing. That no any governor that says that he conducted a dialogue with any criminals. I, Dr. Huza, guess what I said, is a typical lie. It has no basis. If you conducted any dialogue, I have five degrees and four diplomas. I am ready to take back my certificate, back to the institutions that have awarded me 
this certificate, if you have any evidence to show the public, print it in, the, in tomorrow's Tuesday, in tomorrow's daily newspapers. Print your evidence, and I will submit all my certificates back to the institutions they have given me five degrees and four diplomas. So as far as I'm concerned, it is not a dialogue. We have seen Governor Masari moving around the forest. With the loudspeaker, the commanding officer, the, uh, the, 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 the commanding officer of the military, the uh, police commissioner, and the director of DSS, they will just move around the forest and say, where is the white head? Where is the village head? Please come. We know that you have criminals here. Please call them, call them. So they come. They had a discussion. That is not a dialogue. If you, what you call it. Yeah, I was like, so, um, I'm not sure if we still have you, but um, in the interest of time, we would have to wrap yeah, up you must. Um, so, get, so we would have to wrap up the conversation here this morning. It's it's obviously something that can go on for days and days, uh, not you know, with, without uh, ending. Um, and these are very, very important conversations. Um, sadly, of course, uh, we're out of time. So thank you very much, Yahoo Zagetso, for joining us uh, this morning. Ayodele Adio, um, National Publicity Secretary of the Youth Party. Thank you also. Um, I truly enjoyed speaking with you both this morning. Looking forward to another one. All right, many thanks Thank for you. joining us. Thank you. Right. Thank you. All right. Stay with us. We'll take a short break. When we come back, we're moving from security now to politics. The APC's congresses across different states came with reports of violence and, you know, issues, you know, in, in all the states. We'll be talking about that after this break. Stay with us.